Hi, everybody. Uh, we'll get started. I know people will be filtering in, but uh, they'll just miss, miss the beginning here. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks to our dean, who was here a few min moments ago, for all of his support, uh, not only for today, but for the Scarper Center more broadly. Uh, these first few months have really been a whirlwind, and, and it's been with the support of the dean and the school that it's gone so well. Um, thanks to my colleagues. Uh, more broadly, but particularly to Jennifer O'Hare and Melanie McMenamin, who have agreed to serve as interlocutors after Lee's address. Um, thanks to all the staff. Joe Mariani just walked in. Thank you, Joe. Uh, <laughs> Jeanette Cerula uh, and Nicole, Nicole Garofano and Julie Toth, uh, who've done a lot of legwork to make this event possible. Um, thanks to our board of advisors, some of whom are here today. Chuck, I see. Um, uh, we really appreciate it. We're going to have a great meeting, I think, later. Um, uh, thanks to our chair of our board, John Scarpa, uh, there he is, um, whose, whose vision has really um, started this center uh, and, and whose vision I'm honored to be charged with uh, protecting and growing. So thank you for your support. Um, I want to pause before I go on and really introduce Lee to just note how exciting it is to be here. I don't know how many of you were here on Monday in this room. We had another event with uh, Governor Huntsman and uh, <laughs> Steve Chanitson, uh, the, the head of the Gerard de Carlo Center, just doing great work. And it happened just Monday. The place was packed. It was a really incredible discussion. Yesterday, uh, last night, over cross campus, for those of you who know, there's a university on the other side of the tracks. <laughs> Uh, in the Idea Accelerator last night, uh, to Luskery and the, the ICE Institute had a, a great program with Andy Koval, who's the author of Relevance, and it was really fantastic. And so, you know, sometimes we don't recognize all the things that are happening uh, in a place, and I just wanted to pause and, and point out that what we're doing today is just a part of, of a lot of energy that's uh, going on at Villanova. So today, we finish off our triumvirate of great speakers this week with Lee Stein who's our alum, and I think it's fair to say is the human embodiment of where law and entrepreneurship meet. Um, we're lucky to have him, I should note, his parents are here, uh, and, and we're lucky to have him because he's about to be a grandfather, and uh, his daughter has, has graciously agreed not to have the baby uh, for the next two hours. Um, so uh, Lee graduated from our law school. He went on to practice tax law. Uh, before becoming something of a serial entrepreneur. He served as chairman of the board, CEO, president, and a million other things at various firms. Uh, he co-invented certain email messaging processes. Uh, in 1994, he co-patented uh, what The Economist magazine described as the world's first internet banking uh, system, and those patents were then subsequently acquired by eBay. He's been an entrepreneur in entertainment finance, in internet commerce, and real estate development. And then he turned to the environment. Um, I'm not sure it was that linear, but at least that's the way the biography reads. Uh, he formed Virtual Group LLC, focused on early stage technologies. He founded the Southern California chapter of Environmental Entrepreneurs, which is allied with the National, uh, I'm sorry, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, and finally, he formed Prize Capital. Uh, which funds global competitions uh, aimed at discovering innovative solutions in the area of energy and, in, and the environment. And this is just a quote from their website, um, give you an idea about what this, this organization is designed to do. And the quote is, there are many activities which a business or management team can schedule. Innovation, however, is impossible to schedule. It's also impossible to identify from where innovation may emerge. Since the vast majority of humanity does not have access to investment capital, enormous pools of talent are excluded from the innovation arena. The culprit is risk. Methodologies to mitigate risk are essential in order to bridge the cultural gap and enable inclusion of all peoples in solving the problems facing our world. So prize capital helps fund, among other things, X prizes. So if you haven't been on the XPRIZE website, you should go on. It's really, really incredible. It's fascinating and important work. Um, and XPRIZE does lots of things, and maybe Lee will talk about it. Uh, but I want to just finish on one, one point. If you, if you go on to the XPRIZE site and they talk about what they do, they describe themselves as follows. Quote, a catalyst for the benefit of humanity. I think that describes Lee also. So without further ado, uh, Lee Stein. <laughs> Okay, 
Um, thank you very much, and it's really it's humbling to be here. Uh, I want to start off, of course, by thanking my parents, but also thanking Professor Maul because uh, without him, I never would have finished my 1L year. Uh, he was a 3L student and uh, became my tutor to help me get through that first year of law school. And it's, uh, I basically attribute a graduating to and being here today to Professor Maul. So thank you. And, and for those who don't know him, you can wave. And his <laughs> And Lenny uh, Goldberger, who is the person who suggested I be here today, uh, was also a third year student then, and we've maintained a friendship over these some 30 plus years. So it's really an honor to be here, and thank you very much, and, and thank you, Andrew, for have it, having me today. So um, today's talk is going to be a little bit different than any other law talk that we may have had here, and I want to figure out how to use these uh, tools here. Um, so first thing we're going to be doing is, um, I think we're living, in, we're going to talk entrepreneurial today and we'll drop into how that intersects with the law. Um, but I think we're living in the greatest time in history that anybody has ever lived in. And yes, there are some people who think that we should remain in suspense over what's going to happen in the future. Um, but as, of, as far as what we think is, is that the world is changing very, very quickly and we believe that everything is changing exponentially, at an exponential clip. And what I want to talk about today is exponential changes and as uh, Ms. Scarpa and I talked about, it's really the inspiration for what everything is happening right now. And maybe we'll t you'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes as we move through. Um, I have a lot of slides that I'm going to show. I didn't know what the relative awareness level of everybody was going to be, so I decided to go very, very broad. So for those who are deep in a particular area, um, I guess this is, we're going to have to play with this a little bit. So basically, the X, I'll start off with the XPRIZE Foundation, and basically some of the people who are on the board of the XPRIZE Foundation um, uh, um, include people like Larry Page, who founded Google, Elon Musk, who founded Tesla, um, uh, Arianna Huffington's on the board, uh, Jim Cameron, who did Avatar and Titanic, is on the board, um, Craig Venter, who sequenced the human genome. So it is a very, very fun group of people on which to associate with. And, but basically, the one thing that all of us have in common is that we all believe in exponential technologies. And um, um, I'm going to put just a little bit for those who don't know what XPRIZE is, um, if this all works here, um, to basically show you something. And I don't know how to pause this. So, so some of you may have remembered that shot where Richard Branson basically uh, won a $10 million prize to prove that, uh, but they spent $26 million to win that $10 million. Okay, $100 million chased the $10 million, and I'll let a little bit of that play and then I'll just shut, shut it down and pause it in a moment. Um, so basically what happened with that is, is that it was deemed impossible for private people to be able to get into space. When this happened, we basically um, went onto the web, 40,000 people signed up to go into space. That enabled us to raise um, a billion and a half dollars that went ahead into Spaceport 2 for the state of New Mexico to start to build us a spaceport. And with that, we started to do more and more prizes. I'll talk a little bit as we go into the carbon prize, but I'm going to turn that off because it'll be a little bit distracting and we'll just stay on exponential medicine. But for those who needed a visual about what happened, that's how we got started. So um, basically, we're looking at um, the, the, all of the categories listed, energy, water, food, health, education, housing. That's what we're looking at, that we believe that we're living in a world of abundance right now. And while people are struggling to find jobs in law, we want to open your ideas that there is unlimited opportunity coming. And the areas that we're going to be showing you that there's unlimited opportunity are in all of these areas that are listed. 
Um, I'm particularly attached to the area of um, medicine these days because of some family health issues that we've had to navigate. But we're going to first start setting the tone on what's going on exponentially. Now, if any of you have seen this curve, basically there's five Ds that we talk about for things that go exponential. I want you to think Uber because most people can relate to that. The first is when something can be digitized. We go to digitization, then that technology becomes deceptive. It enters the market slowly and people basically say, oh, maybe it's not going to work. There's not really any focus on it. And that's when these curves start getting exponential. The most famous curve that started to become exponential um, is considered to be Moore's Law. And when you look at it from over here, we're basically talking about um, mechanical devices that went into relays, that went into vacuum tubes, that went into transistors, that went into integrated circuits. But basically what happened with Moore's Law, in 1964, Gordon Moore came up with this law that processors would operate at twice the speed at half the cost every 18 months. Now that doubling becomes very effective because when you go from one to two, it's not a very big deal. When you go from two to four, it's not a very big deal. But when you hit the knee of that curve and technology starts going, so this curve has been moving in Moore's Law since 1964. Now, if I'm going to walk 30, paces, 30 steps, I can basically walk, or actually 13 steps in this example, but if I take 30 linear paces and walking across the room, I'm going to go essentially 30 meters. I may get to that back wall. But if we start moving on exponential curves, if I take 30 exponential steps, I can circumnavigate the Earth 26 times. And that's what that curve, and that's what the world that we're all living in right now, not in the traditional linear world that, um, you know, that we're, we're, that we're um, taught to in law schools that we're dealing with. But again, linear versus exponential. This is the way that these curves work. And again, here's that slide again, just to reorient you as to what, what's been happening in, in that arena. Um, okay, so basically what else is going on that's exponential that we should be talking about? John brought up the idea of Kodak. Here's my Kodak slide, John, which is basically Kodak had 143,000 employees at its peak. Instagram had 13 employees uh, when it was acquired. But here's what the numbers that we're looking at as far as what happened to Instagram and what happened to uh, Kodak. Basically, it is one of the greatest collapses of all times. They went from $28 billion market cap with 140,000 employees to being bankrupt with 27,000 employees just at the time that Instagram went with 13 employees into a multi-billion dollar valuation. That's exponential because people aren't buying film anymore. But the interesting thing about it is the digital camera was invented by Kodak. Okay? And they thought they were in the film business. They didn't realize, um, they didn't realize that the number of photos taken every year would change into these kind of numbers. Yeah, until about 2000, they were okay. But basically, they fell from 86 billion pictures a year to 4 billion pictures a year, while the digital world went from 86 billion pictures into 380 billion pictures. So we are really talking about that's exponential. And every one of the industries that you're looking at, and one of the people that you want to work with, the people who want to be your clients, will not be in the Dow Jones in 15 years. They will not be in the S&P unless they're one of the few companies that understands what is exponential. Now, we think that the world is getting better, but we don't really know that because of the way that the human brain works. When we start looking at CNN or we look at the news, the human response to flight or fight or flight, we're really looking at protecting ourselves. We're looking about what could go wrong. We're not really looking at the upside and the news channels are feeding us and just feeding us and feeding us. So if you sit watching CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, you're not going to be getting an understanding of all the things that's happening in the world because you're getting audio and visual feeds that are not exponential. I don't know how many people have heard 
anything exponential on the news lately or any of what the opportunities are. You know, they're not looking at how many steps it takes. They're not looking at how many that you could circumnavigate the world. Uh, what's that number? How many? 26 times around the earth with, with, with these exponential technologies. But the good things that they also don't talk about is the end of poverty, okay, as far as what's been going on. And I'm not going to read the slide. You can evaluate that slide. They're not looking at the number of democracies that have shown up in the world, um, you know, in the past 50 years. They're not looking at the reduction of um, children per family, which is affecting the economics of how families are starting to be working. Worldwide life expectancy, the way that it's been moving. And that number is going to start moving exponentially. We are at the knee of the curve on where medicine is going right now as far as the digitization about that. And when I talk about that, we're, I want to, we're, we're, we'll hit it a little bit later, but I want to mention it right now. We're talking about genomics. We're talking about proteomics. We're talking about viromics. We're talking about microbiomics. We're talking about transcriptomics. We're talking about everything omics is basically what you are. You are a digital being. And all these technologies are converging at the same time. It's not only the processing time, but it's the amount of intercorrelation between things that the human mind was not capable of seeing that we're just on the verge of seeing with some of the quantum computers that are coming into play. And they do exist. I have seen them operated. I have held 3D printed organs in my hand. Okay, that have come out of a 3D printer as part of some of these technologies that we're dealing with. We're talking about more mortality rates are dropping precipitously. We're talking about the average hours work per person dropping precipitously. We're talking about uh, maternal mor mortality rates, years of education going up. These are the curves that we should be looking at, not just the CNN, the crisis news network, the catastrophe news network which is basically what, what we're fed on a regular basis now. Now, when you start to look at this curve, this becomes a little bit really fascinating as far as what's happening in the energy space. And basically what you have is while Moore's law has been working on an 18-month exponential curve that we've been talking about, solar is actually operating on a 27-month exponential curve. And when you follow these exponential technologies, they are all following a curve that's pretty interesting. Now, where we are going with that is we're basically at the point where in solar reaches is a 2% of global demand. But when we start looking at the cost of solar moving to where we're going now, inevitably, we are going to be living in a solar world. The cost of operating a car on solar is going down. Now, a friend of mine, Greg Marinak, who's one of the XPRIZE founders, one of the guys bought a Tesla in St. Louis, and it just took a little bit of while to explain to him that he had a coal-powered car, because coal produces the energy in that market, so he's driving a coal-powered car, you're thinking that he's very green. He's not, okay? But, but basically, where this is going and the cost, this curve will continue we will see a 27-month reduction where efficiency is going up and costs are coming down, but we will be at two cents a kilowatt below the seven to 10 cents that we're dealing with with energy. We will drop on a worldwide basis below coal. It might be too late by the time we get there, um, but um, basically this is what we're talking about, that they're striving for the two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, wars have gone down. Okay, the number of words, we see it on the news and we think that what it is, but you know, the only thing is, is that um, foreign intervention in wars has gone up but, uh, in civil wars. But basically, the wars have been going down as well. Um, the computing power is what we started talking about earlier. It's going to be the theme that we're going to come talking about as well as far as bandwidth costs dropping, computational costs dropping, memory costs dropping, and you all know that because of the cell phone that you operate, that you have in your smartphone that you have in your pocket. But global connectivity is going up. You've got balloons going up by, with Facebook. You've got drones in order to provide connectivity in areas that don't have, well, Facebook's coming up with their own satellite network. You've got balloons going up in areas that don't have the satellite coverage yet. You've got drones going up that are basically impromptu ways of getting broad coverage of bandwidth into areas that don't really have it. And that's going to affect everything, 
Okay, and the reason is because all of the growth and all of the technology and tools have the power of the crowd coming behind it. Basically, if you look at the IoT things, and um, John had mentioned that earlier, <laughs> the number of devices is moving up in the billions. Everything is being connected. As a matter of fact, it's not too soon that you and all of your clients will be a member, will, will be a node on the network. Whether it's your Fitbit, in a sense, you are a node on the network, but these things are becoming smaller, they're becoming better, they're becoming implantable. So it's not only whether your refrigerator's talking to you um, as far as what, what it needs as far as supplies by automatically order, ordering things, but it's really that each one of us is quickly becoming a node on the network. Okay? The, um, if you just look at what's happened in the past five years with global computing power, okay? Um, and I apologize for those on that side of the room because when they switched to get the video, I didn't know that they were killing this slide. So if somebody could, AV person could bring that up, that would be great. But basically, um, the photo, photo, photovoltaic, I get that word out, production, okay, as far as the way it's moving up in, in, in watts as well, has also moved up. So you have two separate things going on, which is the PV pr pr production, as well as the computing power that we're dealing with. And these things are completely different, but they relate to each other. But now we we'll start looking at what that means to you, what it means to your clients, what it means to your investments, and basically what the crowd means. A thousand years ago, if you were not a king or a queen, you had no shot. There was no opportunity. There was no investment. They were the primary source of capital. A hundred years ago, we know what happened with the Industrial Revolution. But that's a long time ago. We're in an exponential time right now. And basically, today's the crowd. You could have anybody essentially go on. When we built our first internet company in 1993, um, it cost me about two and a half million dollars of dilution. We'll talk a little legal here. It took me about two and a half million dollars worth of dilution to build a machine room. I could rent that machine room from AWS, from Amazon services, for a couple dollars a month right now. Okay, I, the, the barriers to getting into the game have just disappeared because of the things that we're talking about. But basically, let's take a look at this. And I, I, I just wish that this was um, um, up, but because this one takes a little bit of time to look at. Um, basically, this is the exponential lo log, um, again, happening on an exponential curve here as to what can happen. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, as far as computing power, the human brain basically operates at 10 to the 16th. When you see an image, it's if you go pick up your kids at a soccer practice, you can look across the field and you can see, oh, well, that might be my kid, and the way they throw their hair or their gait. Computers can't quite do that yet because they're still operating where we are, still, still operating um, kind of at the 10 to the 8th area right now. Uh, Hello? Okay. At the 10 to the 8th area, at the 10 to the 11th area, which is basically an insect brain or a mouse brain because these are liquid computers that we're dealing with. They're living tissue, but they're liquid computers. But this exponential curve that we've been talking about of memory, bandwidth, computing power gets bigger when we start connecting it with the crowd. When you start having not just one mind doing the work, but multiple minds doing the work. When you, and it's one of the things that our prizes do, because we never know where the invention's going to come from. The invention of canning happened because of a prize um, tied to Napoleon in order to have food for his armies. The navigation came out of prize of the Spanish government, um, a clockmaker won it, and Lindbergh flew to Paris to win a prize. These were the crowds came out, and not one of those people who won these major inventions in time came from the industry, not from the food, not from the shipping, not from the aviation industry. They came from outsiders as innovators. But basically where we are headed, and this is inevitable, where we are headed, headed is, is that you've got a billion people coming online with smartphones because of this additional technology in the developing countries. Uh, uh, let me see where we go. Okay, well, let's, uh, the brain is also the artificial intelligence with Watson. 
but AI is more than intelligence, and I'll start talking about um, what's going on with it because you don't necessarily have to have these devices doing all of the thinking. We're merging these devices with us, in ourselves, in a way. Now, Elon, he thinks the world that, that, that something really negative and nasty is going to happen because of the, the ability of these devices to be thinking and be able to do it the wrong way. Um, I got line, I'm, I, I got feet in two canoe on this one. Some people are positive things will happen. I, there is always the opportunity for the wrong thing to be happening here. Um, okay, so let's start looking at what some of the things that are happening with the drones, the drone cameras, the stuff that's happening with the um, iRobot uh, technologies that, that have been coming out of Cambridge. Um, this is part of our life. This is not whether it's going to be happening, but what basically is going to be happening is the social thing that we're going to have to be dealing with with HR, with our laws, with our social compacts, because not just that, there will be, whether that number is the right number of 1.8 million truck drivers will be out of work, there will be eight figures, seven figures of people out of work for that, but just like Avis, you pull into Avis now with one of the advanced stations, you pull in, they know what your mileage is, they know what the f fuel is in your car, and there's cameras that could do the damage assessment. You don't need a person to check you in anymore, okay? It can all happen without people. So not only is it happening with the trucks that are, that, that, that are moving a along, it's going to be happening with every single industry that there is as far as the way that this intelligence starts moving forward. Um, uh, uh, Memphis Meats, I ate this meat called Memphis Meats that was grown in a lab. It wasn't, it wasn't bad, okay? <laughs> okay, um, but now we're dealing with genetic things of humans. So let's talk a little bit about law and social compacts a little bit. My friend, um, D.A. Walla, you may know he's a uh, um, uh, rapper, dropped out of Harvard rapper who was one of the early creators of Spotify. He had his family genetically, his, he and his wife got genetically sequenced. And he, he's, he's happy for me to talk about this in case, because he's looking for advice, okay? Um, they got genetically sequenced and they found out that his wife has something called Lynch, Lynch syndrome. And um, oh, I'll skip over that for now. Both starting to hear. Something called Lynch syndrome. She's got an 80% chance of multiple cancers. The first cancer that she'll get is colon cancer. Manageable. Uh, so long as she does a colonoscopy no less than once a year, she could do it. That, it's not necessarily pleasant, but it's, she can stay ahead of it and avoid, and avoid the uh, fatal risks. The second cancer she's going to get is uterine cancer. Um, actually, that won't happen until they have their first child, and it can be managed, not pleasantly, but with a prophylactic hysterectomy after the first child is born, she can avoid um, that uterine cancer risk and then she'll move to epithelial cancer risks that early detection may be able to help with, but that's decades out, so we figure the technology will probably get there. Okay, so she can do intervention things, but here's a really interesting problem. Um, when they go to have that first child, there's a 50% chance that that child is going to have the mutation. Now, they don't really know what to do about it because if they do IVF, now we're at you know, my alma mater um, that has you know, di different approaches on this and different social approaches, but if they do IVF, they could 100% eliminate the risk of that child having an 80% chance of having cancer. He doesn't know what to do about it. He went to Blue Cross Blue Shield and asked them if they would cover it. They said no. However, if she is, has the pregnancy naturally and the baby's deemed to have Lynch syndrome with an 80% chance of cancer, then she could get insurance to do something she has no desire to do at all. How do you deal with these issues? 
But that's what technology is bringing us, and these are some of the social issues. If we're representing insurance companies, if we're representing uh, religious institutions, if we're representing political institutions, if we're representing um, uh, hospitals, this is something that popped up at lunch three weeks ago on a Wednesday, sitting at lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and he said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do uh, with, with this data that I have. So I just posed that because he said, what, what, what should I do? Well, I'll put on my legal hat, DA. Well, you can go to the insurance company and if you want to get the ins he doesn't really need the insurance, okay? But if you, if you, if you he doesn't need it at all, okay? <laughs> okay, but I said, if you want to make a case out of this, then you let's let's figure out who's going. Let's assume we're going to. You'll be at the Supreme Court with this issue. Let's figure out who you want to bring in to litigate it at the Supreme Court. Let's go spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to write the briefs that will be argued at the Supreme Court, so you can start at the end and figure out what you're going to do. Oh, but before you do that, do know that you're not going to wait till you have a Supreme Court decision on this in order to take care of your wife's health. So that means there's going to be a series of judges that are going to throw you out because you no longer have standing because you already took care of the problem and you don't have standing. And um, just, you know, and, and then if you get through that argument and that series of motions, then you're going to have the defendant insurance company lawyers capitulate and pay you a hundred cents on the dollar for any cost of your IVF if you decide to go that route and all your legal fees because at that point it's not worth a precedent to them. So even if you decide that you want to go to the Supreme Court, you got a couple ways you're never going to get there. So that's sort of like a lunchtime, like non-existing legal advice, you know, they call it curbstone advice, I mean, you know, or you get what you pay for, he paid me nothing, you know. He bought lunch, he bought lunch. So, um, but, but that's sort of where we're going right now with these kinds of decisions as technology merging with law, merging with social issues. Um, but, you know, this is like, you know, there is one company that, um, uh, so now that I'm gonna flop into the 3D printing here. With the 3D printing you're looking at, so I don't really know what to tell him. And it would be interesting to hear some comments when we get to the Q&A if somebody wants to offer advice on that. Um, basically, we're now at the point on construction where houses are being printed with 3D technologies. Okay, they're up, they're up, they're happening. So you can basically are building multiple houses at a time. They're basically starting with material sciences. But we're now talking about construction going seven by 24 by 365. With, without any disruption, whatever. You go to sleep and those machines are still working, building your technologies. Now, with some of the things that's happening with augmented reality and some of the things that are happening with virtual reality, um, I think the next slide, this is my wife. A couple weeks ago, I took her to um, one of our uh, um, labs that was set up where she has a goggle in her hand that you can just about see with that. But that robot, when you put that goggle on your hand, you can basically walk over and pick up a brick that does not exist other than in your, in your eyesight. And that robot will walk over to the pile of bricks and pick up the brick, and then you can move that where you want to move it. So we don't even have to go into artificial intelligence to basically do the thinking. We just have to do the correlation of the visual computing to be able to pick up our motions. Again, we are becoming nodes on the network. And here is an example, and she was out trying that. Uh, uh, um, September 23rd that we did that. Um, so basically, now we're starting to talk about what happens when we become all connected um, and the, the, the network starts talking to each other? Um, or here's another medical thing. My son, Spencer, um, he had surgery where he had his spinal cord opened up and they had to move his central nerves. Um, and he had to go into neuro rehab to learn how to walk again. 
Well, one of the interesting things that happened is, is that he found the physical therapy experience so awkward, that it was so analog, that there was nothing to be done, um, that he'd go to multiple physical therapists and get multiple recommendations on what to do. He started looking at the 3D scanning technology that's coming out for the 3D printing of houses and of organs and so forth. And you now have, there's now a system that within 22 seconds can do a 3D scan of your body, come up with a recommended menu of exercises so that your physical therapist could look at that recommended set of exercises and drag and drop be able to basically be able to give you your physical therapy exercise coming on on your smartphone so that your insurance company could start to increase the adherence so that we know that people will be getting better. That's launching as a uh, startup. The, uh, the seed round has already been completed in that. So here is what starts happening when you start bringing billions of people um, into the network um, with these exponential technologies. It is just happening. The crowd is just beginning. I mentioned this earlier, I mentioned this earlier, but the crowd is just beginning. If you look at the number of internet connected users and the way that that's increasing, and you look at the internet, not only connectivity, but you look at the devices and the memories and the smartphones, there's gonna be another billion minds fairly soon part adding innovation to this network. We have now hit the knee of the curve that it's not just a billion, okay? Uh, um, it's coming from the entire world. Qualcomm, by the way, gave us, uh, gave XPRIZE $20 million to do a Qualcomm Tricorder Prize. We're down to seven finalists. There were 68 original competitors, many of them merged. And basically, it's, the goal is to come up with a five pound portable wireless device that could diagnose disease, 13 different diseases faster than and more accurately than 10 board certified physicians. It's to be designed to be used in a village in Africa or to triage people on Fifth Avenue. Um, but $20 million came up to be able to do that. Um, but you basically, with this technology of Facebook satellites and Qualcomm uh, devices and the smartphones moving to more people and more connectivity coming up and coming up, um, these social issues like uh, DA and his wife are facing or these social issues of where innovation are coming when we're all connected. Um, it's a different world. It's the greatest time in the world to be alive. There's more inspiration and more opportunity because it's, when I say we hit that knee of the curve in that earlier slide, um, we're moving to this place with five million new users, but we're doing it at the point in time that the processing of that smartphone, the processing of that smartphone will be able to do the number of terabytes of calculations that your brain can do as a human being. But it will have more knowledge than just your brain has because it will be connected to all knowledge everywhere that's ever existed. And it will be connected with all knowledge everywhere that's ever existed simultaneously. Okay, with, with artificial intelligence, okay, looking at patterns and looking, coordinating things together. It's happening. This is what's happening. This is the world that the students are graduating into. And this is the world that it is a worldwide connected world. Um, and um, let's go back and look at where we are in the knee of that curve. From electromechanical to integrated. Can you imagine a thousand times more doubling in the next 10 years? We've just, we, we're, we're, you are the, gen, the students here are the generation that grew up on these things, okay? But this doubling is occurring and it's occurring faster and more accurately than anybody has ever, ever imagined. Now, when you look at some of the DNA things that are going on, 23andMe, now, I want to get to one curve on, on graphics. This curve is the genetic conversation um, that we had. Basically, the cost dropped when Craig Venter, who um, were actually, my family um, 
on my other son, we're doing an N of one study at the Craig Venter Institute, looking at microbiome. We're, we're sequencing all the 16 S's. When, we, when his genome was sequenced in 2001, it cost $100 million for that first sequence to be done. Today, Veritas, out, George Church's company in Cambridge out of Harvard, I could get anybody in this room who wants, so I'd be more than happy to arrange your, your full genetic sequence at, for $1,000. A hundred million to a thousand dollars over the course of the last 17 years. And the difference is, is that the new sequencing that's being done is being done at a 30x. So some people have heard about 23andMe where you can get your ancestry. Well basically what happens is at a 30x where they edit out the errors that happen in the computing, that 30x for a thousand dollars is a 3,000, 3,000 times more detailed than the 23andMe that people thought was so revolutionary five years ago, okay? But anybody who wants it, we can make that available. But you may face, you may face a, a, an issue that you don't want to face. But, you know, the question is, if you're flying in an airplane, do you want your pilot to have the data that the engines need to be overhauled? Or some people just don't want to know the data. They want to fly. So it was like, I don't know how to answer that question for, for everybody. I'm a data junkie. I mean, like, full-on data addict, okay, if you can't tell. Uh, okay, it's a long way from Professor Collins' contract course or Professor Rothman's trust in the state course. Um, but um, but um, data seems to matter. But this has been a 13-month 13 exponential curve, where Moore's law was an 18-month curve and solar is a 27-month is a curve, but these things map out exactly, exactly into these curves. Um, I don't, you know, it's like, it's so exciting to be alive right now. The opportunities that are coming up and where they're coming up is just staggering. This is like, I know it's really hard to sit around looking for jobs and filing an application to, you know, one of the local law firms and hoping you can get a clerkship or something because those are linear progressions. But all of your clients who are going to be successful are going to be living in this exponential world. And if they're not, they're going to be marginalized. They're going to be one of those drivers who no longer has a truck to drive. Okay, because they, it, it is, and in this world, if you are not cannibalizing yourself, somebody else will. And it may be the technology itself that starts cannibalizing you. But as far as like how we start to process it, this is, um, they, they just keep coming um, as far as um, the type of analysis that are doing. Now, this is really interesting what started to happen. We saw about 10 years ago maker spaces come up. Those were places that people who like to work with their hands or work with gadgets could come along and go to a centralized place that had the laser cutters and had the whatever tool you could need that you couldn't afford and you can join a club and for $100 a month have access to all the tools you needed and like-minded people. But that's now moved into hacker spaces. Okay, and now we're talking about that this bio thing that's happening with all of this computing power is now going to be available to anybody in the world. Okay, I've been told that I should be ending pretty soon. Okay, the last thing, one of the last things, we'll hit though two or three more slides, is um, one of the places that we're looking at is um, human longevity got formed. It happens to be in La Jolla where we are. Um, basically what they're doing is they are doing the 30X sequencing of um, genomics. They're going after 100,000 people to start to find the data and the correlations. The first studies are fairly expensive. They're $25,000. I can get you a 10% discount. Um, but, but, but if you pull apart all their separate technologies, we could probably get it done for about $8,000 in today's dollars. That's dropping precipitously as well. But they're basically looking at the microbiomics, the genomics, the transcript. The transcriptomics is looking at, D at RNA. Microbiome is looking at the bacteria in your gut. And that's a whole different discussion, but um, I don't think I have time for that. But that's, that is just fascinating is where the world of microbiome is going. Um, they're finding correlations between microbiome and obesity, 
microbiome and addiction, microbiome and serotonin levels in your brain, because there are 10 trillion human cells in your body, but there are 80 trillion bacterial and viral cells. Under some of the theories, some people think that we are only 15% human, okay, as far as the way that we operate, and it's very, very interesting, but um, the technology is moving in that one this fast. But they're looking for correlations, 100,000, um, like I said, viromics, proteomics, transcriptomics, um, metabolomics, um, and find, to, to see whether they can find correlations between any disease states. And they are finding them, okay? So about 10,500 people have moved through it so far. Are we living in a, this is like one of those cheesy slides, but <laughs> you know, are we living, is it getting more difficult or less difficult? I just think it's fascinating and interesting. Um, but the way that we operate is, uh, it just says it, like every brilliant idea was a crazy idea a moment before it was a brilliant idea. And I'll go back, leave it at that. So thank you very much. John and I were having a conversation about curiosity and innovation, and those were the things. And one of the reasons, and he, he, I'd like you to share this as, as well as an answer, if you'd like to answer that. I'll start with the, the keynote for, for a second, which is that, oh, why don't you just go, because you, it's, it's, your, it's your name. <laughs> Imagination, and <clears throat> my theory is that uh, before anything can happen, imagination has to start, and it will create vision. <clears throat> when vision is created, action can be created. When actions are created, things happen, and when things happen, we move forward. Uh, imagination is probably one of the best words that I know of. My other one is anticipation, all of which you spoke about today. But that's where the synergy has come from with our discussion, and that's what I'm trying to foster to develop at the Scarpa Center going forward. I want to see young lawyers begin to imagine, begin to think for themselves, begin to understand that it isn't just in the law books, which by the way, the law books are so outdated anyway because they're all digitized. Uh, <clears throat> and by the time you enter that word, that machine has answered it for you so much faster. So I see all of this taking place at the Scarpa Center. And I think those young men and women who are fortunate enough to currently be there and study will even come to better understand what's going to happen there through vision. That vision starts with me, it starts with Andrew Lund, it starts with our board of directors, it starts with each and every one of us, but more importantly it starts with the students and that's where we're going to make this thing change. Just as you've seen what has taken place here today, that change is going to happen exponentially Good work. and much, fa much faster <laughs> than we think. So I am certainly as excited um, listening to everything I heard today, and thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you. And, and I, would, I would add a couple more words to that. Um, essentially, uh, 
what, what we do, anybody who invents anything, you basically visualize it first, and then you, and then you can materialize it. And basically, whether it's this microphone, whether it's your dress, whether it's that light up there, it, they all started off as a thought in somebody's mind. So in anticipating of it, that, that's what we do. And if the lawyers are not thinking forward, I don't know what happens, okay? Because, yeah, that we will have our court processes, but uh, they're kind of inefficient. Like, I, if you've been through it, I mean, I just, it's just like, whether it's on the litigation side of it or whether it's the cost of the contractual side of it, I, I don't need my two and a half million dollar machine room anymore. I can rent it for pennies, for pennies and enable innovation of another five billion people who are going to have smartphones that are a thousand times smarter or faster than this device at a fraction of the cost of the one that's in your pocket today. If somehow or other figuring out how to get the law in front of it, I, 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 you know, that's, that's, that's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> okay. There's this. Yeah. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, maybe it's a question slash comment. Um, and, uh, well, it occurs to me that one place that lawyers have always played a role is on um, the disruption side of the exponential growth that you described and kind of um, brokering the disrupted relationship and potentially social fabric that results from some of this, frankly, mind-blowing innovation that you've been describing. So I'm curious, it sounds like it's a topic of discussion um, on your board, uh, whether you've thought about doing an X prize connected to sort of new social structures um, and whether that might be a place for lawyers to contribute. Um, I think that's great. We actually, um, as Mr. Scarp and the Dean and I were having that conversation that maybe we could use our, one of our subsidiaries, which is called Hero X, which is a digital platform. At XPRIZE, we only do big revolution, radical benefits, for, radical breakthroughs for the benefit of humanity. Okay, we're trying not to do any prizes less than 10 million in prize purse. But Hero X will do smaller prizes because it's a digital platform. And maybe what we should be doing is jointly with Villanova figuring out how to run a prize on how the law could play in this new game and use it as a, as a place to generate thoughts. I'm just kind of throwing it out there as a straw man, but it would be interesting to sponsor something like that so that we could see if there's some way that Villanova could be at the head of the discussion of what's going to happen digitally. I'd be more than happy to kind of spearhead that with the board of trustees. So I'd really like to you know, offer to do that if, that's you, if, if other people think that that straw man is worth. We just throw things against the wall and see what'll stick. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, so. And, we, and we're going to have uh, regulatory constructs that are going to have to be developed by the lawyers. Like they're not going to develop without being codified somewhere with some rules and processes. But I don't think anybody knows the answer to that anywhere. I could just tell you, I could just guarantee to you, I don't know how you would, I don't know how you would enforce this guarantee as a warranty. 
Um, but I can guarantee to you that there's going to be a thousand-fold increase on an exponential curve in all of the areas that were on that early slide, whether it's health, medicine, environment. When we start, when we, when these quantum computers, the, we don't know. We do not know how to think the way the quantum computer thinks, because the existing microprocessors think the way we think, but the quantum computing, they're there, okay? I, like I can introduce, we could help hold a workshop and bring in some of the quantum computing guys. I can name the companies in quantum. They're, the amount of data that they're able to just rethink uh, tied to the crowd, I just don't know how we're gonna solve the social things. It's, that's not what I was brought in to talk about. <laughs> Okay, so there was, there was another, yes? Are you ever worried about like, one of your prizes that will benefit humanity will pose as a detriment to the environment or ecosystem? The, the, the answer is, is that that's how I said that slide where Elon thinks that AI is going to be horrible and Larry Page thinks that AI is going to be marvelous. The answer is yes and yes. Okay, but at the same time, I chaired the creation of a prize. Um, not only chaired it, but I raised the money for it um, for um, an X Prize related to. It's called the Carbon X Prize. We sort of asked a theoretical question. I asked it in a board meeting. It took six years to raise sixty million dollars. Okay. Um, um, 58 went into the prize, actually 30, 19 in prize operations, nine, uh, tw um, uh, there's prize operations, prize purse, and then we had to host it somewhere. So we actually had to get legislation from the state of Wyoming and the governor passed legislation for us within six weeks of hearing about it in order to get it into Wyoming. So. Um, the answer is yes, but basically the question was, what happens if we could turn CO2 into an asset? Are there technologies out there to do that? And the answer is yes, there's mineralization, there's, there's, there's chemical reactions, there's biological reactions. There are different ways to do it, but nobody had shined a spotlight on it. I asked, and so we raised that money. I asked another question at the last visioneering event that we had that we, I have a green light from staff and from the board right now to go after, which I've been working on for four years, which is um, how many people are aware of colony collapse disorder with the honeybees, that honeybees are dying? A lot of people, okay? So basically we asked the question, like, what happens if the bees die? Like, what happens if this is for real? This is not just a theoretical thing, but is it true that 30% of the food that you get in your supermarket comes from pollinating bees and pollinating plants? You know, where, you know, is that true? So what happens if all the bees die? So we designed, I, my team designed, and remember, I'm just a trustee, okay? There's staff in there. We basically came up with a prize concept, which, we, which is if all the bees die, coming up with robo-bees, robo-pollinators, micro-drone pollinators, and this started four years ago. Now, the concept was really interesting. We were calling it the Plan B Prize, <laughs> okay, B-E-E, -E. um, and we focus grouped it, and people got really upset with us. Oh, you tech guys, you only care about, like, your technology. Why aren't you saving the bees instead of replacing the bees? Oh, come on. You know, it's like, because if they really die, I don't know what happens. We don't know how to pollinate in the wild. We don't know really what happens. Um, so then we went out searching for some biological solutions. I personally made a donation to Washington State University to start looking at mycological solutions dealing with um, um, antivirals for bees, and it started working. The Whittier Foundation came in behind me based on the, the early research and put $400,000 in. We've got hives with as many as 8,000 bees right now, and it's working um, to deal with the, the, the antiviral properties to come up with a biological. Now we're going to have XPRIZE come up with a whole visioneering process where we bring experts in from around the world to try to figure out a, bio, a, a solution, be it mechanical or biological, to look at nature. We think that this is just, so the final way I'll do it, because I know we're out of time now, is when we did the Carbon X Prize, 
I sat down with the CEO of a cooperative utility in the Midwest. 200 square miles of the United States was covered by his power grid that he controlled. 14 power plants vertically integrated from coal mines all the way up. Eight coal, um, six coal, um, seven um, natural gas. They had already done the, the, the fuel switching and one 50 megawatt um, uh, offtake agreement for solar. And he said to me, listen, he knows that one day he's going to be operating his um, utility in a carbon-constrained world. He just didn't know when that was going to be. But he also knew that at the price of $20 a ton of a carbon charge, that that meant that it would cost him at today's usage about $320 million a year right off the top that his ratepayers could not afford and he didn't know what to do. So he wanted to know when he operated in a carbon constrained world, he needed to, do, since there were no technologies on the horizon that he could use to mitigate that exposure, he needed the longest runway possible in order to find environmental carbon solutions. So that meant if he needed the longest runway possible, that means he had to start today because tomorrow the runway is one day shorter. So we got done talking and I said, at the end of the day, I said to them, listen, in 10 years, if somebody asks you, did you do everything possible? Did you do everything possible to, to, to find a solution? If an incentive prize is not part of your pie chart of solutions, then you can never say you did everything possible. And he looked at me with 11 direct reports around the table in, um, in, in uh, Westminster, Colorado. He looked at me and said, Okay, you got your $10 million of prize money. I'll give you $2 million of operating capital. Find some matching money. But so there, we're looking for environmental solutions. Um, but yeah, the consequences of something going really wrong, uh, we have to always look at the unintended consequences because we are living on the other side of the horizon. And thank you. Uh, we have gone exponentially long, um, which is great. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. But there is lunch, uh, and I've been promised it's a really good lunch, up in the faculty uh, center on the second floor. Here are some pages of the, the six Ds of, the, uh, of dematerialization and digitization that I give to Andrew, just so I handed something tangible. Okay, thank you all.